Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on Edexcel Topic 18 Organic Chemistry 3. So this video is specifically designed for um, Edexcel Chemistry. So if you are studying Edexcel A-level chemistry, then this video is, is um, perfect for you. So sometimes you can look at some resources say, online and you can, you're can you wondering if it's in the specification, is this relevant to me? And well, well, this video is, okay? It has everything that's dedicated to it and it's, it is actually um, linked with the specification as well from, from Edexcel. So this is perfect for you. And in fact, there is a full range of Edexcel videos from year one to year two that covers the full um, a range of information that you do need to know for Edexcel, um, as well as whiteboard um, uh, tutorials as well and exam work through. So quite a comprehensive set of resources there and it's all free. All I ask you to do is just hit the subscribe button and that'll be fantastic. So, um, so if you do that, that'll be brilliant. Um, and as long as people keep subscribing and keep watching the videos, then I will keep making them and keep um, adding to it as well. So um, if you want your own copy of these resources here, um, then they are available to purchase. Um, if you just click on the link in the description box, they're very good value for money um, and it means you can use them on your smartphone or on your tablet and you can use them whenever you want, you know, whenever you want to use them. You can even print off the slides and use it as, as part of your revision notes. So um, so, there is, um, so there is plenty of scope there, so you can access them there as well. I like to say it is important to do exam practice as well because it's one thing knowing the content, it's another thing actually doing it. So, so we're going to go through um, everything we need to know for topic 18. Now this has probably got to be one of the biggest topics for Edexcel, so um, bear with me with this one, but um, it does contain everything that you need to know um, for topic 18, so it is, it is condensed into... Uh, into that topic but you can obviously skip to the bits which which you which you want to um you know which you which you want to know about um you know once you get you familiar with this video okay so like i say it is dedicated to the specification and this is the um third organic chemistry topics so it's quite a big area of chemistry as you can see so we're going to look through arenes and um, which is benzene molecules and then we're going to look at amines and amides amino acids and proteins so we're going to look at that uh, that area as well um, as well as we're going to look at some organic synthesis later on. So that means we're going to be looking at um, um, synthetic roots and seeing if you can um, know, see if you can remember the reaction conditions. We're going to have a little bit of a little bit of a quiz um, later on regarding that. Um, and then obviously we're going to look at um, uh, practical techniques as well towards the end of the video. Okay, so let's start with benzene. So benzene is a cyclic planar molecule with the formula C6H6. It has four, it has four valent electrons and each carbon is bonded to two other carbons with one hydrogen atom. And the final lone electron is a P orbital, which sticks out above and below the planar ring. So you can see it there. So you see we've got our carbon atoms there. Our P orbitals are above and below this atom and we've got the hydrogens that stick around on the outside. So the lone electrons in the p orbital, what they do is they combine to form the delocalized ring of electrons. And you can see it there. It looks like a bagel or a donut or something. So you've got the electrons here. These then start and fold towards each other and form this delocalized structure here, which is quite unique. And actually due to this delocalized um, electron structure, all of the CC bonds in the molecule are actually the same length. They have the same bond length of 139 picometers. So... Um, that's quite unusual. Um, so benzene, as you can imagine, will have some quite unique properties when it comes to reactions and, and looking at its um, physical uh, physical properties as well. So the carbon-carbon bond length in benzene lies somewhere between 154 picometers, which is the bond length for a single bond, and 134 pic picometers for a double bond. So this does suggest that actually it isn't straightforward in terms of just single and double bonds, as we're going to look at the um the the proving of the structure of benzene because um it's it's not quite as straightforward as you as you might think so benzene is normally drawn in a skeletal formula okay so it makes it a lot easier to draw rather than drawing all the carbons and hydrogens and all the bonds in the hexagon so we show the structure um of benzene in a skeletal form like that now the structure there is actually showing all the double bonds 
that are in benzene. And this is called a Kekulé structure. And this was named after a, a scientist called August Kekulé who basically discovered it. And he thought that actually there was alternating double and single bonds. Um, and so you might see it drawn like this, but mo most often, and actually what you should be drawn it as is the, is the other way, um, which is this way. Once it comes up, there we are. Okay, so it comes up with the circle in the middle, and that just symbolizes a delocalized set of electrons. So you can see here we've got a delocalized um, electron ring, um, and we can say that both can be used, both are technically right. Normally, the, the Kekulé structure is used um, when we're trying to describe um, uh, like reaction, reaction mechanisms, etc. Some chemists prefer to use that, um, but you will see it um, more common. Uh, as the one with the circle in on the right there. So remember, because this is a skeletal formula, it doesn't show the carbons or hydrogens, but there are hydrogens attached to each carbon. So don't forget that. So especially this is going to be more important um, to not forget that when we look at reaction mechanisms, such as Friedel-Crafts reactions, nitrations, etc. Um, so that's going to become more important, but you'll get used to it. Okay, so benzene is actually more stable than theoretical than the theoretical alternative cyclohexa 135 triene. So that's Kekulé structure. So that's the alternate and single and double bonds. So and this actually proves the delocalized system. So actually, if we measure the stability of benzene by comparing the enthalpy change of hydrogenation in benzene and in cyclohexa 135 triene, we can actually um, you know prove that actually benzene does have this delocalized system. So, for example, if we hydrogenate cyclohexene, so it has an enthalpy change. So this is the adding a hydrogen onto the double bond, uh, and it has an enthalpy change of a minus uh, 120 kilojoules per mole. So that's the enthalpy change for adding hydrogen to one bond. And you can see on there that um, the the reaction effectively that takes place. So in theory, it should be minus 120 kilojoules per mole. So you'd think because we had three double bonds in benzene, then that would just be three times minus 120. So that means the energy would be minus 360 kilojoules per mole. That's what you would think, isn't it? However, when we measure the enthalpy change of uh, hydrogenation for benzene, it's a lot lower. It actually comes out at minus 208, 208 kilojoules per mole. Um, now, this is obviously the experimental value. This is you know, the value that we get when we actually do this uh, this reaction. So you can see the predicted one would have been minus 360 kilojoules per mole, but actually benzene comes out at minus 208. So what does that mean? Well, it means like the energy required to break the bonds and the energy released uh, to form the bonds. So this suggests that actually more energy is required to break the bonds in benzene um, than it is in cyclohexa 135 triene. Okay, so this basically tells us, remember bond breaking is uh, endothermic, so you need energy to break them. Bond forming releases heat energy. So this is actually coming out at lower, it's less exothermic than we thought. So what this means is that actually benzene is more stable than um, the theoretical cyclohexa 135 triene, um, whether you've got the three separate double bonds. And so um, the stability um, is mainly due to, well, it is primarily due to that delocalized electron structure in there. It, you know, the reason why benzene arranges itself in that way with the delocalized electron structure is to increase its stability. So it is a lot more stable doing it that way. So it's very different. So it's all exciting. Right. Thankfully, look at you. There's loads of stuff on this, <laughs> loads of reactions and everything. Um, so we're going to look at the combustion of benzene. Why not? Um, it, it wouldn't be chemistry without burning something, would it? So, so we're going to look at the combustion of chemistry. So benzene is a hydrocarbon, and like many hydrocarbons, it burns readily in oxygen. Okay. Um, now, benzene burns in oxygen to produce your carbon dioxide and water. If it's burned completely, if it isn't, obviously you produce soot and carbon monoxide, etc. Just like with any other hydrocarbon. Um, so the combustion reaction for benzene is two lots of C6H6, 15O2, will form 12 CO2 and 6 H2O. So there's nothing different there. So you will be expected to balance the equation, uh, but the products of combustion are the same if it's complete combustion as it is here. It's carbon dioxide and water. So in reality, though, um, and we don't live in a perfect world, so in reality, carbon doesn't burn completely, um, and so there's never enough oxygen to burn these things completely in air. Uh, and as a result, we do get a lot of unreacted carbon atoms, which is things like soot, 
um, and actually benzene generally burns um, with a, a, a black smoky flame as you can see um, you know the diagram there is just showing what benzene could burn like um, so with back with a big smoky flame there because it's um, more likely to burn um, it, it's rare for any reaction to burn completely to have sufficient oxygen there it's uh, it's incredibly rare. you're always going to get some incomplete combustion and benzene um, you know has this uh, evidence of this as well okay so what we're going to do um, is we're going to look at uh, addition reactions. Okay, so we're going to look at we're going to compare basically reactions where you would have um, yeah adding a molecule to a double bond, and then we're going to look at how benzene actually reacts because benzene doesn't really have double bonds. It doesn't have single bonds either. It's got this halfway house. So what we're going to do is do a compare and contrast and talk about the types of reactions that you do get with benzene and there's the good bit of benzene chemistry is really to do with the reactions and mechanisms. So we're going to start with first looking at a type of reaction is if we had a double bond. And this is the addition of bromine to a double bond. And we call this electrophilic addition, okay, because alkenes with a double bond, a bit like um, the Kekulé structure that we'd seen before, um, they undergo electrophilic addition. So if we add bromine water to an alkene, this causes a color change from brownie orange to colorless. So remember, bromine is that brownie orange color. So this brownie orange color um, of bromine is bromine is actually the electrophile, and this adds to the alkene, uh, forming dibromoalkene, which is colorless. So remember, an electrophile is an electron-loving species. So bromine is actually going to be attracted to the high electron density in the double bond, as you're going to see here. So here we are, we've got um, our alkene. Now what happens when bromine, a bromine molecule, Br2, is normally neutral, doesn't have a charge because you haven't got a, you haven't got a, um, a charge difference here. But as the bromine molecule approaches the alkene with loads of electrons, we actually induce a dipole in bromine. So what we get, as you can see there, um, I'll use the pointer here, so you've got delta negative bromine and a delta positive uh, bromine atom here because this end of the molecule is close to this which effectively nudges the electrons to one side. So it's like a temporary dipole. Now, this polarization um, now makes it quite reactive. So let's have a look. So we've got the electron pair in the double bond, like we say here, that's attracted to the delta positive bromine. And um, this forms a bond with the bromine and starts to break this bond here or sever this bond. So let's have a look here. So we've got the electrons moving from the double bond to the delta positive bromine. Remember, uh, curly arrows always show the direction of electron transfer. So this is moving from the double bond to the bromine. And you can see here that then breaks the bond between the bromines and it forms our intermediate, which is our carbocation. Now you can see here, we've got the bromine that's added on there. The double bond no longer exists now. Uh, and we have a, a an electron deficient carbon there in the middle. But remember, we still have our bromine, our other bromine atom, that's floating around. Now this has a negative charge because the electrons from the bond have moved onto it and has a lone pair of electrons. So what do you think is going to happen here? Well, no surprises. The bromine is then going to attack that delta positive carbon and then we finally we get our product, which is colorless. 1,2-dibromoethane is formed. Okay, So this is an electrophilic addition reaction because we're adding to the double bond and we'll look at reaction types later in the video as well. But we're adding to that double bond um, and because we're adding to that double bond and um, we're adding sorry we're adding using bromine bromine is your electrophile because it is attracted to um the high density of electrons in this double bond hence the word electrophile okay so now just keep that in your mind okay the reactions of adding bromine to an alkene we're now going to contrast that with reactions of arenes okay so when arenes undergo um, when arenes undergo reactions, they undergo electrophilic substitution reactions, despite the fact that they've kind of got a bit of a, a double bond in there, kind of, like a halfway house between a single and a double bond. So benzene has a high electron density um, because of that delocalized ring structure, and this is attractive to electrophiles. Okay, so it's electrophiles. Remember, these are electron-loving species. So that's fine because previously, with normal double bonds, we had electrophiles because they've got a high electron density. So that's normal. But 
Um, as we've seen, benzene is really stable. It's not like a normal alkene. So unlike traditional alkenes, they do not undergo an addition reaction. So like what we've just seen before. So this would disrupt that benzene ring. And remember, if you've seen any of my other videos, then um, I always say that atoms and molecules are incredibly lazy. They don't want to be put in a position where they're higher, higher energy than they need to be. So because of this nice stable um, benzene ring and um, to disrupt that benzene ring is just is just not going to happen easily so you need something with some clout to really break that ring open and um, actually add your um, functional groups to that to the benzene ring so instead they undergo a substitution reaction so this is where remember one of them hydrogens around the benzene ring is substituted for the electrophile that we're reacting it with and so there are four mechanisms that you need to know. I know it's a lot. Um, there's four mechanisms, don't worry. They all, they all follow the same mechanism, so don't worry about that. Um, so just see it as four potential opportunities to gain marks. The mechanisms are the same. So you just need, if you remember the mechanism, you can apply it to any of these. So that's fine. So there's a friedel crafts acylation, friedel crafts alkylation. Yes, they did two reactions because they're greedy. Um, there's halogen, uh, halogenation reactions as well uh, and nitration reactions. So we're going to go through all four of these and we're going to look at the reactions of benzene, how we add, first of all, what friedel crafts reactions are and then looking at halogenation and nitration reactions and seeing how these mechanisms work. Right, so... Aromatic compounds are molecules, remember, that contain a benzene ring. So just to, just to go through this um, uh, before we actually go into the actual reactions of these, we need to understand what we're actually, how we name these, okay? So this is just a, before we go into the reactions about the, na the nomenclature of them. So there are known as, um, the arenes are known as, so aromatic compounds, um, so molecules that contain uh, benzene rings are known as arenes and they're named in two ways and so what we do is we name um, some of them with benzene at the end such as bromobenzene you'll see that later in the reaction we're going to see things like methyl groups so uh, one two dimethyl benzene so we'll put benzene on the end for that one uh, and also things like nitro benzene so you're going to have a look at some of these reactions here it's just so you know how we name them uh, but sometimes um, we use the word uh, phenyl, for example. So we'll look at phenols later as well. But uh, phenol is just a benzene ring with an alcohol group and hydroxyl group attached on the end. And sometimes um, things like phenylamine is another example um, where actually we use the word phenyl at the start there. So you just need to be familiar. You're not going to know. You're not going to. You don't need to know many reactions for this um, in in the scope of chemistry, of course. Um, but so you do need to know that. Um, when to use um, benzene at the end and which ones are going to use phenyl. But you'll get used to them because you'll see them written and drawn so many times. Okay, so as we've seen before, benzene undergoes electrophilic substitution. Okay, so remember that's, that's what we mentioned there. Um, and we need to know specific reaction conditions associated with these types of reactions. So for example, here's our benzene ring and we've got an electrophile. An electrophile... Um, this one here has a positive charge and that's that's an important point because remember it's no point in just having a, a delta positive so a weak kind of par partial positive charge in a molecule that just isn't going to cut it that isn't going to break this benzene ring apart and um, so you can do a substitution what we need is a real proper positive charge on our molecules or so highly reactive species so the electrophile um, the delocalized electrons in the benzene ring these um, attack um, the carbocation, which it's more than likely going to be, um, unless it's um, um, unless it's halogenation or different or a nitration reaction, but it's going to attack a delta positive carbon um, in this example here. So the electrons move from the bond, which breaks the ring, and a positive charge starts to develop. So you can see here the electrons in the CH bond that's um, that's been. Uh, that exists here then move back into this disrupted benzene ring okay it's temporary um, and then what happens is the electrons jump in here and that reforms this benzene ring and effectively the hydrogen has been substituted so we've got our electrophile here with the positive charge um, electrons jump onto here onto the electrophile and then that effectively adds itself on there so this is the so that should say e really for electrophile um, so that adds itself on there 
and then the hydrogen, the electrons on this bond goes to the positive charge, and then we're left with our electrophile as added on there. So that should say E for these ones, because that just, it, it's the the mechanism is the most important bit here. But um, so it's the electrophile that's been added on. So benzene rings are very stable uh, molecules, so reactions are difficult. So we need a very strong electrophile to react. So thankfully we can um, we can. Uh, these can be created by using something called halogen carriers, um, which is going to be um, vitally important for any any types of these reactions. So you'll see how halogen carriers work later, but typically um, halogen carriers are aluminium-based, so they're aluminium halides, for example, AlCl3. So you need to know this is the generic reaction for um uh, electrophilic substitution reactions so we're going to look at specific examples obviously the the reactions that were mentioned before okay so remember one of the four that you need to know of the specific reactions were friedel crafts reactions now benzene is used widely in the pharmaceuticals and dye stuffs um, and it's widely used um, in these industry in these types of industries so it is important that we need to know about these reactions and how we actually add things to the benzene ring and change it to make it suitable for what we want to use it for. The stability, though, of benzene is difficult. So what we need to do is these two uh, people, which is Friedel and Crafts, and I'll show you them in a minute, they came up to um, with a, a solution to how do we actually react things with benzene. So here they are here. We've got uh, Charles Friedel and James Kraft, and they were French and American uh, scientists, and they came up with a reaction where an acyl group or an alkyl group um, can be added onto a benzene molecule. Um, and so after the acyl or alkyl group is added, the benzene structure is weaker and it makes it easier to modify to modify it further to make the useful product. So that was the idea was to initially just to add the molecule, um, the group onto the benzene ring, make it weaker, and then we can actually add whatever we want with it um, after that. So in order to do this, the benzene ring, um, in order to add it to the benzene ring, the electrophile must be um, powerful. Uh, and so therefore it must have a positive charge, a proper positive charge. So acyl groups have a positive charge. However, it isn't positive enough. So remember what I said last time, where a delta positive won't cut it. It has to be a full positive charge for these reactions to go. And so we use the halogen carrier as a catalyst, remember, which is aluminium chloride, AlCl3. And this will actually allow us to produce that stronger electrophile first. Then what we do with that electrophile is then react it with the benzene ring. So we have to make it first, then use it. Okay. So in the Friedel Crafts acylation or alkylation, we react an acyl chloride or a halogen or alkane um, with the halogen carrier to create that strongly positive electrophile. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at now. On the next slides, we're going to be looking at how you actually uh, make the uh, powerful electrophile using this halogen carrier. Okay, so to make it, we need to go. We need to undergo via this reaction here. So aluminium chloride AlCl3 accepts a pair of electrons away from the uh, acyl group. In this case, we're going to do uh, acylation for this one. So you can see here that we've got an acid chloride here, an acyl chloride, and you will have seen that uh, back in topic 17 when we looked at acyl chlorides in a lot more detail. We react that with the halogen carrier, which is AlCl3, um, and as a result, the polarization uh, and a carbocation, the result of the, the polarization increases, and the carbocation is actually created here. So we form AlCl4- minus here, and we form our carbocation, and this is what is then going to react with our um, um, with our uh, benzene molecule. So this is our electrophile. Okay, so the stronger electrophile um, because that has that proper positive charge. Okay, so now we've made our positive electrophile. That's how we've used it. We now need to react it with benzene um, and. Um, we're going to make a less stable phenyl ketone. This is going to be done under reflux and a dry ether solvent. So reflux is used when you want to um, uh, you want to react two volatile substances together. So if we heat these without uh, the use of reflux, then it would just evaporate into the atmosphere, and obviously we don't want that. So we use reflux to effectively keep our reaction within um, within the the reaction vessel um, it allows us to heat it to allow it to react but 
not allowing it to um, escape into the atmosphere. So here's the first one. So here's our uh, carbocation. Um, this is our electrophile. And we've got our benzene ring. So remember the general mechanism. So the delocalized electrons, they're attracted to that carbocation. The two electrons jump from the uh, delocalized ring structure um, and a positive charge um, the, uh, the, it jumps towards the positive charge in your electrophile. So then what we have is this substance here. So our uh, our acyl group is added onto the uh, onto the benzene ring and you can see here that we've got um, a broken delocalized system and this has the positive charge there so the next thing with these is you can see that we've got our halogen carrier that's now obviously in this reaction at the same time so the next thing is the negative alcl4 minus so this halogen carrier is then attracted to the positively charged ring and one of the chlorine atoms breaks away to form a new bond with the hydrogen so and the electrons from that bond then move into the positive uh, the positive ring structure and this then effectively reforms the ring again and we've got our uh, phenyl ketone that's actually formed so you can see here that the halogen remember this was a catalyst your halogen carrier so because this has lost the chlorine we form alcl3 back again uh, and the hydrogen and the chlorine from here form hydrogen chloride gas um, and that's the, the critical thing is that the, the, the ring is reformed but we've broken that ring structure now and added that group on Okay, so we're going to look at alkylation as well, and we have to make the um, a powerful electrophile. Again, we're going to use aluminium chloride for Friedel-Crafts alkylation. Um, and so the mechanism, we're going to show the mechanism below. So this time we're going to use um, a halogenal alkane or haloalkane here. So this already has a bit of polarity on it already, as you can see. So um, the aluminium chloride accepts a pair of electrons away from the halogenal alkane. There we are, okay. And then them electrons there then react and jump onto the aluminium uh, aluminium there. And as a result, we have our carbocation that's formed, which is left on the side there. And then obviously we have AlCl4 minus that's, that's um, remaining. And we'll see how that reacts a little bit later on. So the stronger electrophile is now produced. There it is there. This is it, there's the stronger electrophile. And we're now gonna use this to react with our benzene ring. So let's add this to the benzene ring. And again, we do it under the same conditions, reflux and a dry ether solvent. So there's our um, alkyl group. So again, same system, electrons from the delocalized system jump onto that alkyl group there, okay? And then we form this intermediate with the delta positive charge, this broken ring structure here, but they are added on. It's exactly the same as the other mechanism. And then in comes our halogen carrier because it's attracted. Our halogen carrier has got a negative charge. It's got a positive, so it's attracted to it. It's the same stuff. Okay, so the electrons uh, move to form a bond um, with the hydrogen. So the chlorine is broken off as well, off the aluminium, uh, of the uh, halogen carrier. And then the electrons move from that uh, CH bond to back into the ring to reform the ring structure again. And then we've added our alkyl group here. There it is, there's our alkyl group. That aluminium chloride catalyst is reformed and also we produce HCl gas as well. So you see the mechanism is the same as it is for the friedel crafts acylation reaction. So it's no different. Okay, so alcohol-based groups can also be added to um, the benzene ring as well. So we can see here, um, there's our um, alcohol uh, alcohol-based group that's that's attached that's attached on here we've got a carbocation so if we use an electrophile um, that contains the um, an alkyl chain and with the OALCl3 so it's it's actually bonded onto the molecule here then this can add uh, an alcohol-based group to a benzene ring and it follows the same process so you can see here we've added this on except our aluminium carrier our halogen carrier sorry um, is not actually separated it's actually joined on to the to this molecule here this alcohol group this what would have been an alcohol group so you can see that the whole thing adds on 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 here and we still have that positive charge in our benzene there 
And then what I've done is I've color coded it just so you can see what's going to happen here. So the electrons jump from this bond here and they jump onto the oxygen. And then the electrons from the oxygen move onto the hydrogen, which is on there. And then the electrons between the carbon and hydrogen move into that um, that uh, delocalized electron system for stability. So effectively what's happening here is this bond is breaking. So that forms your AlCl3. Uh, this is forming a bond with hydrogen to form your alcohol, which is there. Okay, so this is your alcohol-based group. So this works in a similar way to other Friedel-Crafts reactions as, um, as the oxygen in the group has a lone pair of electrons and this allows it to act as a nucleophile um, in terms of forming the bond with the hydrogen on there. So it's a bit of a different reaction, but it's a way in which we can add an alcohol-based group onto a benzene ring. But the mechanism is the same. It's just this bit here, which is a little bit different to all the other ones. But nonetheless, you still need to uh, know how this reaction works. Okay, so we're going to look at the nitration of benzene because that was the other reaction that we need to know. So this is the third reaction. So remember we had, um, we had Friedel-Crafts acylation, Friedel-Crafts alkylation, and we've also got nitration of benzene. So nitrating of benzene is actually really useful because it allows us to make substances like dyes for clothing and explosives, okay? So such as um, um, uh, trinitrotoluene, which is TNT, that's used for explosives. So if we heat benzene with concentrated nitric acid and concentrated sulfuric acid, um, we form nitro benzene. However, like we've seen before, we must create a really powerful electrophile first. It's no good just using a delta positive. We need a full positive charge as an electrophile. So the first step is to make the electrophile first. And we do that. We don't use any halogen carriers here. So we're not doing that. But what we are doing is we effectively react the nitric acid and sulfuric acid together first. Uh, and you can see here, um, concentrate nitric, concentrate sulfuric. That forms uh, H2NO3 plus and HSO4 minus. Okay. So you can see that if you remember from your um, acid base equilibria topic, um, where we look at um, um, con uh, conjugation and we look at um, the uh, bronsted lowry theory about protons being received and accepted, you'll see that we've got two acids here. But the, um, the nitric acid here is accepting a proton. So nitric acid is actually acting as a base because it's accepting a proton to form this. Sulfuric acid is acting as an acid because it's donating a proton to form this. So just be really careful. That. I know it sounds strange because you think, well, hang on, both of them are both of them are acids. But I mean, yes, they are both acids, but they're behaving. One's behaving as a base and one's behaving as an acid. That's why you've got to be very careful. So the HNO3 that we formed in that reaction then decomposes to form the electrophile, which is the nitronium ion. So we've got H2NO3 plus forms NO2 plus and water. So now we use the nitronium ion, which is NO2 plus, and we react it with benzene to produce nitrobenzene. Okay, so that's the that's the critical thing here. So if we have a look, we've got our benzene ring and we have NO2 plus. We've got our nitronium ion at the top there. So the reactions, as you'll see, are very, very similar, the mechanisms. So the nitronium ion has that positive charge. That's the electrophile. And this is attacked by the benzene ring formed an unstable, positively charged ring, as you can see on the bottom here. So there's your positively charged ring. We've added our um, nitrate group on there, and we've got our hydrogen. So then, just like with the other ones, the electrons in that hydrogen, carbon-hydrogen bond, move in to reform that delocalized electron ring. And then we get nitrobenzene. Um, is formed and the H plus is formed which actually reacts with the HSO4 minus that we used in the previous one so remember one of the products of the previous reaction was HSO4 minus the H plus that comes from the benzene reacts with that and that reforms H2SO4 so your H2SO4 is a catalyst okay so that's that's proof that that actually behaves as a catalyst because it is reformed again it's not actually used up in the reaction Okay, so we've got to do this at temperatures, at specific temperatures. So at a temperature 
below 55 degrees, this will ensure a single uh, NO2 substitution. So anything above this, and actually what we get is multiple substitutions. So we get substitutions that are um, um, attached onto multiple parts of the benzene ring. So you've got to be careful with that because if you just want a mono substituted um, nitration reaction, then you've got to do it below 55 degrees. So normally you would do that in a in an ice bath. Um, you would put your beaker in the ice bath and let it um, make sure it never goes above 55 because this reaction actually generates quite a lot of heat. Um, so it generates quite a lot of heat, so we need to make sure it doesn't go above 55. I don't know if you've tried doing it. You might have um, done nitration reactions already, um, but um, if you have, then you'll know actually it's a very it, gets, it heats up quite quickly. Okay, so we're moving on to a different part, which is phenols. So phenols... Um, phenols have a hydroxyl group which is an OH minus group and that's attached to the benzene ring. I remember we'd seen that before when we we're looking at the nomenclature of some of these aromatic compounds or these arenes. So phenols has that OH group. So there's your phenol there, okay, very straightforward. But we can also have things like 2-methyl phenol as well. So your phenol group has your OH group on the benzene ring, on the top of the benzene ring. Um, and you can see that we here we have a methyl group just coming off it. So this is coming off the second carbon because we always say that wherever the OH group is, that is carbon one, and then the methyl group is carbon number two. So this is two methyl phenol. Okay. Here's another example. This is salicylic acid. So here we've got phenol, um, and we have our um, uh, a carboxyl group that's hanging off on the end here so we also know this is salicylic acid so you might have seen that um, but you'll see how that actually works uh, when you make um, aspirin so this is why it's going to be quite important um, for for this video okay so phenols are more reactive than benzene because um, mainly due to the higher electron density in the ring um, and this is actually directly caused by the OH group attached to it so Electrophilic substitution reactions are much more likely to happen with phenol um, than with benzene because of this um, orbital overlap that we have between the OH group and the and the benzene ring. So you can see here the electrons in the p orbital of the oxygen in the OH group. These are the ones that are in green in the diagram. These overlap with the delocalized ring structure, and so they are partially delocalized into the uh, into the pi system. So the electron density increases within that ring structure and so this means it is much more susceptible to attack from electrophiles so you can see here these electrons here are moving in um, and are merging into this benzene ring structure which makes it even more uh, electron rich than uh, than what you would get with benzene okay so we're going to look at how you make aspirin because aspirin is quite a well quite an important drug it's probably a very old drug um, but aspirin um, is used as a, as a painkiller and it's actually made by reacting ethanoic anhydride or ethanol chloride with salicylic acid. And we'd seen salicylic acid as a, um, obviously it was a phenol with your uh, carboxyl group hanging off the second carbon. So we're going to see how that particular molecule um, can be used to form a pharmaceutical product such as aspirin. So you can see there's our ethanoic anhydride. So anhydrides have this... Um, um, this structure here where we have it looks like a carboxylic acid if you just look at that bit there the one in blue it looks like a carboxylic acid and what we've done is we've bonded another carboxylic acid to it so this is called ethanoic anhydride and I've color coded it so you can actually see um, where the atoms are being attributed to so this is going to react with our salicylic acid which you can see on there and this is going to form aspirin so this is the molecule for aspirin uh, and we're also going to form our ethanoic acid. So this is our carboxylic acid that's um, that's been formed here. So that is the formula for aspirin. So you need to know that reaction. So you need to be able to use a phenol-based reaction here. Now, just showing you where these molecules come from, you can see the bit from the anhydride here adds on to the oxygen from the phenol. So the hydrogen is removed, which is this bit here. And this hydrogen is then used to react with the remaining bit of your anhydride to form your um, ethanoic acid here, which is also known as vinegar. Okay, so ethanoic anhydride is used instead of ethanol instead of ethanol chloride in industry, um, mainly because a it's safer, it's less corrosive, it's nowhere near as nowhere near as reactive, 
Um, it doesn't produce harmful HCl gas. So you remember, um, you'll remember from topic 17 when we looked at acid chlorides. Acid chlorides, when they react with, say, alcohols, for example, um, they, which is effectively what's happening here, um, they produce HCl gas, which is not very pleasant at all. It's acidic and it's toxic. So if we can come up with them, uh, a reaction where we're not going to produce products like that, then that's got to be better. Um, it's a lot cheaper to use, which is from an economic side, that's obviously quite good. And it's a lot safer. It doesn't react as vigorously as acid chloride. So it's a much slower reaction, a much more controlled reaction. Um, and again, that's got to be better than using um, acid chlorides. Okay. So phenols, they partially dissociate, which means they're actually weak acids. Okay, so they, they fit into that category. So they would react in the same way as any other weak acid would do, such as a carboxylic acid. So phenols dissociate weakly to form a phenoxide ion and a H plus ion. So your phenoxide ion is obviously this molecule here. We've lost the proton. Remember, uh, an acid, a bronsted Lowry acid is a proton donor. So you can see this has obviously donated the proton from there. Um, phenols also react with alkalis, just as you expect with any other acid. Um, they form salt and water. So in this case, we're reacting it with sodium hydroxide. And this is going to form the salt, sodium phenoxide, and water. So this is, again, this is no different to a standard acid-base reaction. It may look different because we're applying it to something else. But it's not, it's not something extra that you need to remember. It's just something that if you know that acids react with bases to form salt and water, we're just using a different acid, that's all. It just has a big hexagon attached to it. Okay, so phenols, they can react with um, bromine water, um, which is which is nice. So um, phenols react with bromine water as phenols are more reactive than benzene, so that they, they react a little bit more readily. Uh, and we observe a brown um, decoloration, so the brown color of bromine decolorizing as we form our, um, uh, our, our um, uh, product with the benzene with the bromine substituted in it. So for example... Um, you can see here we've got the phenol reacting it with bromine, which is Br2. Um, the OH is what we call an electron donating group. So remember, it pushes um, uh, it pushes electrons into the uh, benzene ring. So it pushes it into there. Um, and so therefore, what we actually get is substitution occurring at uh, carbons 2, 4, and 6. So the product is therefore 2, 4, 6 tribromophenol. So we get it 1 two and three because the alcohol is pushing electrons in there remember we've got that delocalized system so we get substitution at these points on the bromine uh, on the benzene molecule okay so try 246 try bromophenol smells of antiseptic it's insoluble in water so it's quite oily um you might have heard of another type of chemical which is quite similar which is called tcp that's called trichlorophenol so you use chlorine instead of bromine so tcp is something you buy it in the shops um and tcp is normally you would gargle uh, tcp if you had um say if you had a sore throat um you would gargle tcp because it's a good disinfectant so um if you ever wondered what it smells like get yourself a bottle of tcp you can get it in most places like Boots or Superdrug or somewhere like that. Um, so you can get, um, over the supermarket, you can pick up a bottle of TCP and you can see what it smells like. You might have some in the cupboard as well. So um, very antiseptic. Um, it's got that like kind of antiseptic smell. So that's, that's as close as you're probably going to get. So phenols, um, these can react with dilute nitric acid. So um, you can see that phenols react with nitric acid um, as well as benzene. So remember with benzene, we had to actually react it with concentrated sulfuric acid and it had to be concentrated nitric and we had to create that nitronium ion to then add onto the benzene. So you remember that from there. Um, but with phenol, um, the OH is an electron donating group uh, into this. So that's why substitution occurs at carbon two and four in this case. So all we do is we add our um, dilute nitric acid is enough we don't need to actually create a positive electrophile here and it just adds on to uh, this carbon here carbon two and then carbon four here okay so we've got two isomers produced of this type so you've got 
carbon, uh, two nitrophenol, and four nitrophenol here. Obviously, you might think, well, why don't you have one here as well? Well, if we did have one there, that would still be called two nitrophenol because that would be the second carbon. So that's why we only get two um, uh, two isomers that are produced, which is two nitrophenol and four nitrophenol. Okay, and then they only occur in them spaces as well because it's an electron donating group, as we've seen before. Okay, so let's look at another area of organic chemistry, which is amines. So an amine is derived from ammonia molecules, and it will contain a nitrogen atom, uh, and this is where hydrogens are replaced with an organic group, such as uh, an alkyl group. So we get different types of amines. We get primary, we get secondary, we get tertiary, and we get quaternary, so we get a right family here. So this is very similar to, for example, alcohols, where you get primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols, and also halogenoalkanes, when we looked at SN1 and SN2 reactions, you get primary, secondary, and tertiary. So this is the same, except this is obviously looking at amines instead. Okay, so let's have a look at the first one. This is a primary amine. Um, it is, um, this is the uh, methylamine. So you can see here that we've got a nitrogen here and this only has one methyl group attached to it. So remember, this is what we're talking about. So this is a primary uh, amine. Secondary amines, um, this has two methyl groups or two organic groups attached to it. So we've got one here and one here. So this is a secondary amine. Um, a tertiary amine is something like this, where we have three methyl groups surrounding the uh, nitrogen atom, but that can be any organic groups and have to be methyl. And then finally, we've got quaternary salts. Um, this is where we have four um, alkyl groups, organic groups surrounding it here. Uh, but you can see that, remember, nitrogen can only bond three times. This one's got four bonds, so that means we have this positive charge in the nitrogen, so it is a, it is a salt. Um, we can also get aromatic ones as well. So this is phenyl amine as an example. So this is an aromatic amine. It is a primary amine still because we only have one uh, or, uh, organic, organic group attached to the nitrogen. Okay, so these are non-aromatic amines are known as aliphatic amines. And you might see the word aliphatic used um, uh, later on. So when I'm referring to something as being aliphatic, it means it doesn't have a benzene ring in basically. Okay, so aliphatic amines are made in two ways. Okay, so they're either made by reacting a halogen or alkane with excess ammonia, or they can be made by reducing a nitrile. So what we're going to look at here is going to look at the first way of making it, which is reacting a halogen or alkane and excess ammonia. Okay, so um, with each step, what we're going to do is we're going to add a halogen or alkane. You'll see this later on when we do the reaction. So I'll just keep that up there. So you can see that um, the mechanism for making each uh, amine is similar. So instead of using two ammonia molecules, we use two amines instead. So here, what happens is the primary amine, methylamine, reacts with the chloroethane to form a secondary amine. So you can see here that actually, um, here's our primary amine here, and we're gonna react that with um, a haloalkane, and that's gonna add and form the primary amine. And then the primary amine is then going to react again with more haloalkane to form a secondary amine. And that's going to keep on going until we form the quaternary amine. Okay, so let's let, have a look at the example here for the mechanism for this type of reaction. So we'll see how that actually works. So you can see here we've got our haloalkane, which is here. And we've got our ammonia molecule, which is here. And this has the lone pair of electrons. So remember from that previous slide where we had a primary, a secondary, a tertiary, and a quaternary. And the reaction keeps going and it keeps reacting to produce these products. Well, this is where we're going to show you how that works. So you see we've got our ammonia molecule here and our halogenoalkane, our haloalkane. So the ammonia first um, is a nucleophile. So it is nucleus loving. So that means it will attack the delta positive carbon. So... Um, it attacks that and it tries to form a bond with the carbon and then that kicks the chlorine off. So we get an intermediate that's formed and this is an alkyl ammonium salt um, and it has a positive nitrogen uh, and a Cl minus ion that's down here. So then what happens 
is um, we've got our second ammonia molecule here. This is why we use excess ammonia. Second ammonia molecule here, which will then, clearly you can see this is going to react with the hydrogen and then the electrons from the bond between the N and the H will then jump onto the nitrogen to effectively neutralize that positive charge. So this, this is why we need that excess because you've got that second ammonia molecule um, and then gets involved and then we produce our primary amine and an ammonium chloride salt is then produced so you can see there we are we formed our primary amine from there and obviously we formed our salt now you can see obviously remember we needed an excess of ammonia and the reason why we need an excess is because we need one here to act as a nucleophile which is this bit here um, and then here it's actually acting as a base here because it's accepting the proton, it's taking that proton. So it's acting as two, it's got two functions here. So you've got it acting as a nucleophile and acting as a base here. Now you can see that using this method has a downside. So the mechanism that we saw, um, we saw the production of a primary amine. However, like we say from the previous slide, um, this reaction carries on to produce secondary, tertiary and quaternary um, ammonium salts and so we actually do have an impure product so this occurs because that primary amine that we've just made there still has a lone pair of electrons on that nitrogen so that can act as a nucleophile with your halogenoalkane and it can keep on reacting and reacting until um, you get to the quaternary salt so the amine can, like I say can, can react with any remaining of that halogenoalkane to produce that secondary amine and then keep on reacting okay so that's important so this method is a is quite a quick method however you do get a lot of impurities in there you get primary secondary tertiary and quaternary results so if you're in the business just to make a primary amine this method's not very good because you're not going to get much um, primary uh, a good yield of your primary amine okay so let's look at another way of doing it so the second way remember is by reducing nitriles so in this example, we're going to look at reducing nitriles using a nickel catalyst and hydrogen gas. So you can see here the cheapest way to make a primary to make primary amines um, in industry is to reduce nitriles using hydrogen gas and nickel, um, or we can use a platinum catalyst. So this reaction is called catalytic hydrogenation. It's got a quite a cool name. Um, and unlike using a halogenoalkanes, as we've seen there, um, this reaction produces primary amines only. So we just get a pure product. Okay, so we're not getting any secondaries or tertiaries or quaternaries. We're just getting primary amines, which is which is just nice to be honest. So there we are. Here's our nitrile. Remember, a nitrile has got the C triple bond N bit on the end here. So you've got nitrile group reacting with hydrogen using a nickel catalyst, high temperature and pressure, and we produce our um, primary amine here. And the good thing with here is good thing with this is we produce our primary amine, but we don't produce any other secondaries, tertiaries, or quaternaries. So you get a good yield of primary amine. So this is really good. Okay, so we can also um, um, look at using lithium aluminium hydride and dilute acid so there's two ways of, of reducing a nitrile so obviously that one we use hydrogen so this method is more expensive than using your hydrogen a gas and nickel or platinum catalyst um so we're using um lithium uh, aluminium hydride here which is very expensive so it's not really an industrial process that's followed to make your um aliphatic amine so this reaction is a reduction reaction and we use the reducing agent. Remember, we use H in square brackets to symbolize a reducing agent. Um, and this is dissolved in a non-aqueous solvent. So we use a dry ether, anything like that. So we can't have any water in there. So you can see here, we've got our nitrile still, still the same reagent, but this time we're using a, a reducing agent, lithium aluminium hydride, for example, and we're using a dilute acid and we're forming this product here. Now, the reason why we have a four in front of there is because we need to add four hydrogens to this molecule to turn it to this. So we can see we've got one, two there. So there's two hydrogens there. And we need to add two hydrogens to the nitrogen on the end here. So that's there. So that's why we need four. Even though this is not an actual molecule, um, it's just H in square bracket, we must still balance it. So make sure that you're looking and um, for the number of hydrogens left and right and it still balances out. Okay, so we've looked at how you make aliphatic amines. So this is how we're going to make aromatic amines. 
So aromatic amines are made by reducing nitro compounds such as nitrile benzene, which we've just seen how to make. So we've looked at the nitration of benzene. So aromatic amines are used to make dye stuffs and pharmaceuticals. So they do have a, a, a quite a lot of use in everyday life. So the first step in making this is we heat under reflux nitro benzene with concentrated HCl and tin to form a salt such as C6H5NH3 plus Cl minus. So here's our reaction here. Okay, so there's our first step. So nitro benzene, uh, we reduce it using concentrated HCl and a tin catalyst. Okay, so then step two is the salt produced in step one is reacted with an alkali um, such as NaOH to produce an aromatic amine such as phenyl amine. So you can see here that we've um, uh, we've used this here, um, we've used the nitrate, sorry, the, the nitro benzene to actually produce your um, aromatic amine here, such as phenyl amine. So this is all done under reflux because um, we're using volatile compounds here. And you can see here that actually we're using six lots of reducing agents. So the reason why we have six, um, six here is because we need um, two for every oxygen that comes off, we need two hydrogens. Um, because we need to form a water molecule so because there's two uh, uh, oxygens here we're going to form two molecules of water so four of the hydrogens go to form there and we need another two to actually bond onto the nitrogen that we formed here which is our NH2 so that's how we make our phenylamine okay so amines have a lone pair of electrons and this allows them to accept a proton and hence they act as a base okay so this is quite standard so a proton bonds to an amine via a dative covalent or a coordinate bond. And both electrons in the bond originate from the lone pair on the nitrogen. Okay, So you can see here, there's our um, primary amine, which is here. Okay, So we've got our group and we've got our nitrogen with a lone pair of electrons. We add a proton onto that and it forms this dative covalent or coordinate bond here. We have an overall positive charge there so you can say this is why amines are bases because they accept that proton and the strength of the base is actually dependent on the availability of the lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen so the higher the electron density the more readily available the electrons are okay so what we're talking about here is the availability of this lone pair of electrons and the availability of this is going to be dependent on what is bonded around that nitrogen okay that's going to have a quite a significant influence Okay, so it's the type of group that has the influence on how readily available the electrons are. Okay, so in order of base strength, the, the start again, the order of base strength is um, down to, um, like I say, the groups that's attached to it. So the weakest bases are actually aromatic amines. So that's the ones with a benzene ring attached to it. Then it goes to ammonia, and then your primary aliphatic amines are stronger bases. So let's see why that is the case. So here's our different amines, and we've drawn the structures out here. So we've got our aromatic amine to the left here. There you go. And we've got our stronger um, primary aliphatic amine that's on the side there. So benzene is an electron withdrawing group. Okay, so we've seen that, remember, with um, we've seen that with our uh, phenol molecules. So it pulls electrons away from nitrogen. Um, and into the ring structure and so the electron density on the nitrogen reduces so the lone pair availability reduces as well so this means that aromatic amines um, are less basic than other types of amines because of the um, the withdrawal of electrons into this benzene ring and I've drawn this kind of highlighted structure here just to show where the electrons are moving to okay so obviously um, amine uh, sorry ammonia um, has no groups on there which are withdrawing or pushing electrons in. So ammonia just has its um, electrons centrally based in the nitrogen there. Okay. Um, and then with um, alkyl groups, so um, your primary aliphatic amines, as we'll see here, alkyl groups are actually electron pushing groups. So what they do is they push their electrons um, towards the nitrogen, and that means that the electron density in the nitrogen atom is much higher, and therefore they're more readily available, them electrons. So this means that they're more basic, because they're much more readily, um, they're much more 
and readily available to accept a proton which obviously makes them basic there so you can see the strength of the base is all to do with the groups that is attached to the nitrogen are the electron withdrawn are they electron donating and you can see that has quite an influence on it okay so amines um, are also nucleophiles as well as bases so remember they have a lone pair of electrons so they are going to be attracted to delta positive um, areas of molecules as well as we've seen for example with our halogenoalkane reactions that we've seen before we can see that obviously these um, you know uh, amines and um, ammonia acts as uh, nucleophiles Okay, so let's look at solubility of amines. So we looked at the chemical properties and how they can be formed and how they react. But now we're going to look at the physical properties of amines. So we're going to look at solubility here. So amines can hydrogen bond with water. And so some have the ability to dissolve in water to form alkaline solutions. So just like we looked at the solubility of carboxylic acids and carbonyl groups, we need to also look at the physical properties of amines. So the lone pair of electrons on uh, the nitrogen can form hydrogen bonds with the hydrogen atoms on water molecules. And so the lone pair on the oxygen can also form hydrogen bonds with hydrogen on the, uh, on the, on the amine as well. So this, is, uh, that's, um, so this is to do with the, the oxygen on the water molecule, as you can see. So here's our, um, here's our primary amine here, because we've got the methyl group that's attached to it. This has got a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen and can form a hydrogen bond with the hydrogen on water, but it can also form a hydrogen bond with um, the oxygen on water as well, as you can see. So we've got both types there. And so only smaller amines will dissolve. So just like with carboxylic acids, so larger ones have larger, have longer hydrocarbon components, which are non-polar, and these can disrupt the hydrogen bonding within the water molecules. So it's all to do with the size of these groups here. If these are quite long and have long hydrocarbon chains and they're going to be less soluble than the shorter ones okay um, and so if the amine is large enough then the London forces between the non-polar hydrocarbon chain so that's the bits that circled in yellow here so that's these parts here um, these are um, so we'll see the uh, we lost my train of thought here so if the amines are large enough then the London forces between these non-polar hydrocarbon chains will be stronger than the hydrogen bonding between the nitrogen and hydrogen um, between the uh, on the uh, diagram that you can see here so this means that the larger amines will not be able to dissolve so for example if these chains are really really long we have um, uh, we have our London forces which hold these forces together if them forces are bigger then the interaction between the um, primary amine and the water, then it will be insoluble. So basically, that's what it means. Okay, so let's look at amines and complex ions. Now, we looked at transition metal. and the transition metals topic, you would have seen uh, complexes and the look of uh, complex ions. So here, we're going to look, bring that back in again from that topic and look at it in particular to do with amines. So there's a bit of crossover here. And there always is with these with these topics. They're never just, okay, they're in isolation, but there's always bridging between other topics, so that makes it a little bit easier to, to remember, I think. So amines react with copper complex ions to form that deep blue solution. So remember that from, from the transition metal topic. So that's exactly the same. This is just um, effectively summarizing that area of chemistry, but it also falls within the amine chemistry, clearly. So we can see here, we've got our copper complex here. So this copper complex is formed by dissolving copper two sulfate in water and you can see we've got all our water ligands surrounding the copper so if you remember that so if we add a small amount of butyl amine to copper sulfate solution a pale blue precipitate is formed and we can see it here okay so we're adding a small amount here um, and so what the amine does is it removes two protons because it's acting as a base removes the two protons and we form this here so we've got um, OH2 and H2O4 so you remember that from the transition metal topics like I say but if we add more butyl amine so we're adding it in excess then four of the ligands will be exchanged with the amine and we're forming the complex on the right and what we now form is a deep blue solution so if you can remember with transition metal complexes we have um, a 
um, a precipitate that forms when we have a complex that's neutral. So you can see here that we've only added enough uh, amine here to remove the protons and we formed a uh, copper's got a two plus charge, which is in here. Um, two of the hydrogens on the water are removed to form an OH minus. So this effectively forms a neutral complex, which precipitates out in solution. But if we add more, then what we do is we form a, a charged molecule again, a charged complex here. Um, and what we get is a complete substitution of our um, of some of the ligands on here. So we always remember with these ones, with the copper ones, it's one of the strange ones where you don't get full substitution, you get partial substitution. So we get two of the um, axial um, water molecules remain, but the rest are actually substituted and we get this nice deep blue color. And so this is the complex that we form there. Okay, so if the amine is larger, um, we may get obviously a different shape complex. It depends on, remember if, if you get a really large ligand, you can't fit as many of them around that central metal line. So you might get something that's more akin to a tetrahedral shape rather than an octahedral shape that we can see that we can see on there. Okay, so acyl chlorides, these react with uh, butyl amines um, and the chlorine is substituted for the nitrogen. So um, you would have seen this um, in the organic chemistry topic, uh, organic chemistry 2 topic, which would be topic 17. Um, you would have seen um, this reaction as well. So we're bridging into that topic as well. So a lot of this is not new. Um, this is just drawing other areas from other topics and bringing it into um, into an amine category. So reaction with primary amines produces N-substituted amides. This is a vigorous reaction that produces a solid white product. So let's have a look. So you can see here, we've got our acid chloride there, ethanol chloride, um, and this is uh, reacting with our amine, which is this bit here. Um, and this is going to form our N-substituted amides. Now remember, in terms of the nomenclature of it, N is the nitrogen it's substituted the substituted bit is because in a traditional amide as we'll see later uh, traditional amides have two hydrogens here so it's nh2 and um, that's what a traditional amide looks like but one of the hydrogens has been substituted for an alkyl group so in this case it's a butyl group so that's why we say n butyl and then it's ethanamide because we've got two carbons here so it's ethanamide now your butyl amine um, can also react with the HCl. Okay, so there's this one here, there's a butyl amine, it can react with this HCl to produce butyl ammonium chloride. So that can react further to produce this salt here. Okay, so just be aware of the reactions that happen here. Okay, so the overall reaction, if we club all of that together, we've got our acid chloride, which is here, reacting with our butyl amine, um, which is here, and then we form our and substituted amide which is here and then obviously our salt is then formed here so um, this is the overall reaction here um, and we need two of these obviously to to undergo this reaction okay so it's not too bad okay so we're just coming to the end of the amine section for this so there's a lot of amine they really do like amines don't they at excel so um, more amine reactions here so just uh, just a few more. So amines also react with acids to form alkaline uh, solutions, um, and they form alkaline solutions, to say. So amines are bases, so they do react with acids to form salts. Um, however, unlike traditional acid-based reactions, there's no water that's formed. So this is one of the um, niche things with amines, is actually when we take an amine, react with an acid, it's still a neutralization reaction, but we're not producing water like what you would expect with a traditional acid-based reaction, you form salt and water. So this one, you just form your salt and it's one product. And so smaller amines are soluble in water um, and these can dissolve to form alkaline solutions. So remember, they um, they are soluble if you have a smaller alkyl, um, alkyl groups on them. So unlike some bases where there's an OH group, for example, sodium hydroxide, amines react with water to produce the OH minus ions that they require. Um, and so remember, this was in the um, um, acid-base equilibria topic when we looked at this to do with the bronsted lowry acid, uh, and we looked at what makes something a base. So this is just drawing some information from that topic. Um, and so you can see here, 
um, that they produce the OH minus ion, which makes the solution basic. So you can see in this reaction, we've got a primary amine reacting with water, and effectively you produce um, your OH minus ions in this way by using water, because the molecule itself doesn't have OH minus ions, and for something to be basic, it must have OH minus ions uh, present there. So this one's just using water effectively to do that. Okay, so remember we said we looked at some of the amides already, in particular N-substituted amides. So we're just going to look at amides in a little bit more detail here. So amides are just derivatives of carboxylic acids, and they have this functional group of CONH2. Okay, so that's the main difference between amines don't have that carbonyl group near them. Amides do have a carbonyl group. That's the main difference between them. So here's an amide, and you can see there's our carbonyl group there. Okay, with an amine, that wouldn't be present. So that's the main difference between amide. So this is an amide with the NH2 group on the bottom, as you can see. So instead of having the OH, it has the NH2. So this is why it's a derivative of carboxylic acid. And then obviously we have our N-substituted amides, and we've seen these before. So N-substituted amides, it's just one of the hydrogens is replaced with an alkyl group, as you can see on there, which is represented by R. Okay, so acyl chlorides react with um, ammonia to produce primary amines. So remember, we looked at this um, um, back in topic 17. So all we're doing is bringing some of the information from topic 17 and fitting it in within the amides and amines topic within topic 18. So we can see here the reaction with ammonia produces amides. So remember this. So you've got your acid chloride reacts with your ammonia molecule. So this is ethanoyl chloride. Um, and this produces your um, ethanamide, so in this case here, so you've got your amide, um, and this is a vigorous reaction, if you can remember, produces HCl, white mist of fumes, acidic and toxic, so not a great reaction to use um, if you don't have a fume cupboard, obviously you should use a fume cupboard for, um, for this type of reaction. Okay, so let's look at, um, again, this is um, a, a bit of an information from topic 17, organic chemistry 2, um, the reaction of um, acyl chlorides with amines, primary amines, produces N-substituted amides, so that's what we've just seen before, so there we are, so there's our ethanol chloride, and we've got our primary amine there, and that's going to form our N-substituted amide, in this case it's going to be N-methyl ethanamide, again this is a, a vigorous reaction producing white misty fumes. Okay, so um, might be familiar with you. It depends on which order you've seen the videos or you've you've studied it in school. Um, but um, yes, or college, or if you're learning independently, that's obviously, you know what I mean. Right. Okay, so we're going to link a lot of these organic chemistries. And again, we looked a little bit of this in the last topic. So this is topic 17. Um, in this topic, we're going to look at polymers in a lot more detail. We're going to look at all types of polymers here um, and look at their reactions and how they're formed. So this is going to be quite important. So we're going to look at condensation polymers first, and they're comprised of three main types. So you've got polypeptides, polyamides, and polyesters. So condensation polymerization is where we get two different monomers with at least two functional groups that react together. Okay, so um, they react, when they react, we get a link that's made and water is eliminated. And this is why we call them a condensation reaction. So the link determines the type of polymer that's actually produced. Now, in the previous topic, we only looked at polyesters because esters falls under that topic. In this one, we are going to look at polyesters and look at it in a bit more detail, but we're going to look at other types of polymer as well. So you can see the types of polymer are polypeptides, which are found in proteins. We've got polyamides, which are formed by reacting diamines and dicarboxylic acids. And then we have polyesters, which are formed by reacting a diol and dicarboxylic acids together. So you can see here, here's some of the examples here. So um, obviously polypeptides are found in um, the white is, is protein of an egg. Um, we've got polyamides here, which form this type of rope here. Uh, and then polyesters, obviously used in fabrics, as you can see there. Okay, so let's look at polyamides first. So polyamides are formed by reacting dicarboxylic acids and diamines together. So remember, and um, we must have um, a, uh, we must use a dicarboxylic acid uh, because it has um, two carboxyl 
groups on either end of the molecule and that allows us to form a chain and likewise with the diamine. So let's have a look at what they are. So amide links are formed when dicarboxylic acids react with diamines. And so we have to use dicarboxylic acid and diamines as they have functional groups either side, which allows us to form the chains, as I've said before. So let's have a look. So a dicarboxylic acid sounds scary, but it's fairly straightforward. Um, it's just a carboxylic acid, like I say, either side of the group, as you can see there. And then we've got diamines, which have an amine group either side of the R group in the middle. And then obviously if we wrap them together, we form a polyamide. And you can see there's our amide link. This is an amide because we've got our C double bond O, our carboxyl group, um, not a carboxyl group, a carbonyl group, bonded near the NH group, which is here. So this is an amide link. And you can see at the end here, you've got your OH and your H here. These can then react with, um, this can react with the diamine and this can react with the dicarboxylic acid to extend the chain length. So this is a condensation reaction, so water is eliminated. So that's where the water is removed, and obviously that forms your amide link in the middle. So you can see it kind of makes sense. So with it being a condensation reaction. So let's have a look at an example of a polyamide. So Kevlar is an example. Um, so you don't need to know this specifically. It's just really so you can see what it, what it looks like. But um, it's used in bulletproof vests, uh, car tires, and some sports equipment as it's lightweight. Um, but it's strong. So Kevlar is made from benzene 14 dicarboxylic acid and 14 diaminobenzene. So you need to know the, um, you know how these can actually uh, bond together. So benzene 14 dicarboxylic acid is this. So you know the structure of that. You can draw that. And your 14 diaminobenzene is exactly the same, except we have um, an amine group that's attached to either side of the benzene. And then when we join that together, we form Kevlar. Uh, and you'll notice when we draw polymers, is we put a square bracket around the edge here, and we have trailing bonds coming off either side. So this shows us that this is what we call a repeat unit, uh, and N is the number of, uh, is basically however many you've got these in your polymer. So um, we have two, um, two water molecules that are emitted as well when we're forming this type of uh, repeat unit because we've got water eliminated from the middle here and water eliminated either side. Okay, so um, like I say, so this is the formula uh, and the part in the bracket is what we call the repeat unit. Okay, so let's have a look at another example of a polyamide. So this is nylon 66. So nylon 66 is a polyamide that's used in ropes, carpets, clothing, parachute fabric, etc. So it's quite a, quite a strong fabric. Um, it's made from hexane dioic acid and one six diamino hexane the six and the six is just the number of carbon chains in each of these molecules so you can see here there's your hexane dioic acid so you've got six carbons in here so there's four there and obviously one either side i think you're getting the hang of this now so one six diamino hexane so you've got your diamine and then if we join all that together we get our nylon six six with the two water that's also produced so you can see how Fairly straightforward it is. Obviously, we're removing the water in the middle and forming our amide, uh, amide link here. Okay, so polyesters. Now, we've seen a bit of this already in the previous topic, but polyesters are formed by reacting a dicarboxylic acid and diols together. So ester links are formed when dicarboxylic acids react with these diols. So there's our dicarboxylic acid. We've seen that before. Uh, at this time, instead of using a diamine, we're using a diol. So this is just an alcohol group with two OH groups either, obviously two, H, two OH groups either side. So this forms our polyester, and you can see we have our ester link in the middle there. So we have our carboxyl group at the end here. So there it is, um, and then we have our um, ester link, which is over on this side. Uh, so we are diol, which is on this side here. So you can see this is a condensation reaction because water is eliminated. So this is exactly the same as your amide, the ones that we've seen before. Okay, so an example of polyester is uh, terylene, and this is used um, in drinks bottles, sheeting, clothes, for example. Um, so it has the acronym PET. So terylene is made for benzene 1,4 dicarboxylic acid and ethane 1,2 diol. So this is just to give you an idea of what these um, what these look like. 
So you can see here your benzene one four dicarboxylic acid. So you've seen that before. This is reacting with ethane one two diol. Okay, um, and then this obviously forms our terylene um, product here, which is just joining the two together. So they might give you in the exam like complicated examples. Maybe they might give you complicated ones like this. Um, and all you have to do is you're just looking for the link, an ester link or an amide link. You take the water out from it and join it together. So don't be too startled by examples like this. It's just showing you how, how similar all these reactions are. Okay, so for condensation polymers, we, we can actually work out the monomer from the polymer chain. So the monomer can be determined by finding the repeat unit that we've just seen before. And we look for either an amide or an ester link, depending on what type of molecule we've got. So for example... Here is a polyester, and so we have an ester link that's highlighted there. So when we're trying to find the monomer, all we do is we break that bond between the carbonyl group and the oxygen there. We break that and we add a H or OH to either side of the molecule. So here it is here. So this forms our monomer units, and these are the units that we used to make the polymer in the first place. So fairly straightforward. Okay, so condensation polymers, these can be hydrolyzed, and that means they can be um, split using water. So hydro meaning water, lysis meaning to split. So this produces the original monomers that we use to form the polymer in the first place. Um, it's just the reverse of polymerization. So again, it's not too, not too difficult here. So you can see here's our polyamide. Um, a polyamide molecule. Um, this is um, reacting with water because it's hydrolysis. And what we do is we form our monomer units back again. So in this case, it's dicarboxylic acid and diamine. And so to determine the monomer units produced, and remember we break the uh, bond in the middle of the amide and the ester link of the repeat units. So we need to identify that repeat unit. Um, and then we add OH and H to each of the monomer units as we've seen before. Um, and remember, for polyester, we produce dicarboxylic acid, dicarboxylic acid and a diol. Uh, and for polyamide, we produce a dicarboxylic acid and a diamine. So just remember that. Okay. So let's look at another type of polymer, which are amino acids. Now, amino acids have an amino group, which is NH2. And they have a carboxyl group, which is COOH. So you can see here, they have a carboxyl group. And we have an amino group. And so this is a carboxylic, um, this is a, an amino acid. So amino acids are amphoteric. And what this means is that you have acidic and basic properties. So they can, add, they can um, act as both. And so amino acids always have an organic side chain. And this is represented by R, which is on here, with the exception of glycine, where R is actually a hydrogen. So, um, so, that's, so that's the only exception there. And so amino acids are chiral, as you may have seen. So they have four different groups um, around it. As you can see, this one's got one, two, three, four, obviously with the exception of glycine, because that would have a hydrogen there. And that means it would only have um, three different groups. So that doesn't make it chiral. So what that means is most amino acids, though, um, can rotate plain polarized light. So amino acids are named in two different ways, and they have a common name and a systematic name. So this is using IUPAC rules, and it's fairly straightforward. So step one, what we're looking for is finding the longest carbon chain. So in this example, the longest carbon chain is three, as you can see here. So we've got one, two, three. Okay, so don't forget to count that carboxylic acid carbon as well. So this is propanoic acid. And then step two, we just number the carbons. So carbon one is in the carboxyl group member so we always number from carbon one so you remember from um topic 17 in organic chemistry two so when we looked at um when we looked at uh, naming carboxylic acids we always name from uh, carbon one in the carboxylic acid is uh, so the carbon in the carboxylic acid is carbon one step three we note the number where the NH2 group or groups sit. And here we can see that the NH, uh, the NH2 group sits on carbon 2. So we call it amino when we're naming the amino acid. Okay. So step four, we name any other groups um, that are not um, NH2 in the standard way. So for example, OH, we call that hydroxy. So we just name it. So the name of this is 2-amino propanoic acid. 
So it's pretty straightforward, not too not too difficult. Obviously, calling it an amino acid helps to sharpen your mind to say, right, it must be amino and then acid. So it must be the amine group, then the acid that we name after that. Okay, so we're going to look at um, uh, amino acids and behave in them or how they behave as bitter ions. Um, so it's a little bit of German there. So if you do German, so you'll know what a bitter ion is. Uh, so a bitter ion is just a molecule with both positive and negative ions. So zwitter ions only exist as the amino acids isoelectric point. Okay, so we're going to look at what the isoelectric point is. Um, so that is just the pH at which the average overall charge is zero. So this is dependent on the R group. Okay, so let's have a look. So here we've got a zwitter ion. Okay, so we've got two ions effectively. So a single charge negative charge and a single positive charge so as vitrine is likely to be formed so this is a vitrine when um when at a ph at the isoelectric point so both the carboxyl and amino groups are ionized okay so both have got a charge so at low ph's so in acidic solution so if the ph is lower than the isoelectric point so which would be stated so each amino acid has an isoelectric point this would be in a data book, obviously you'd be provided with that. Um, so if it's the pH is lower than that isoelectric point, then the COO minus group, this bit here, is likely to accept the proton. Okay, so it's going to receive the proton there at low pH, because obviously there's loads of H pluses. And then likewise at high pHs, if the pH is higher than the isoelectric point, then the NH2, um, sorry, the NH3 here, is likely to lose a proton to form NH2, which is on this side. So that's just dependent on if the pH is above or below the isoelectric point, which of course you'd be given. You're not expected to remember them. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, thin layer chromatography. So chromatography is an important uh, method of separating uh, substances out. So thin layer chromatography allows us to separate and identify uh, amino acids as they have different um, solubilities. So this is about trying to identify these amino acids. So thin layer chromatography, also known as TLC, how lovely, uh, uses a stationary phase of silica or alumina mounted on a glass or metal plate. And a pencil line is drawn and drops of amino acid uh, mixtures are added. So you can see here there's a drops of amino acid. So we have a mobile phase, which is the phase that moves so this is um, a liquid solvent. And then we have our uh, stationary phase. This is the, the bit that doesn't move, which is this plate here. Um, and so that's bit of silicon dioxide or aluminium oxide. Uh, and then we put a glass lid on top and that just prevents our solvent from actually evaporating from this. So we place the plate in a solvent um, and the baseline must be above the solvent level. If it isn't, then we're going to get our substances effectively dissolving into the solvents. And of course, we, um, well, obviously we, we don't want that at all. So we leave until the solvent is moved up to near the top of the plate. So up towards the top here, we remove the plate and mark the solvent front and we allow that to dry. And then it works by the amino acid mixture spots effectively they're dissolving in the solvent some of the chemicals in the mixture may not, may not dissolve as much and actually spend more time stuck to the stationary phase um, but either way what we're going to be left with is a chromatogram of um, migrated um, amino acid spots moving up this plate and so we can identify the amino acid positions uh, on the chromatogram because we can measure it and we're going to look at how we calculate RF value on the next slide Okay, so amino acids can be identified by calculating the RF value from a chromatogram. So you've got your chromatogram already established and then we're going to calculate the RF value. So the number of spots on the plate tells you how many amino acids make up the mixture. Okay, so amino acids can be identified by calculating the RF value. So if we've got um, um, four, three, uh, four spots on there, it means we've got four amino acids. But that doesn't actually tell us what amino acids there are. So we have to do a little bit of maths. And this is um, done by calculating the RF value and comparing these with a library of known RF values. So you can see here, 
we've got our um, chromatogram, we've got our solvent front which we've drawn in, and we've got the distance travelled by the amino acid um, spot which has moved on here. You might have a few spots uh, on here, but this is just for simplicity purposes. I've just put one in there. So the RF value is calculated very simply, and it's just the distance travelled by the spot, which is represented by the red arrow, divided by the distance travelled by the solvent, which is the purple arrow here, so that's up to the solvent front. And so the RF values are fixed for each amino acid, so they're the same. However, um, if temperature or the solvent or the makeup of the TLC plate changes, then we're going to get different RF values. So RF values are only true for um, certain um, for certain amino acids if the conditions are kept the same, as you can see. So there is a lot of factors that you must keep the same. Okay, so we're going to look at um, these type of reagents. Now, these are a funny reagents. These are called Grignard reagents. Now, Grignard reagents are vital to help with carbon-carbon bond formation, which happens all the time in chemistry. Um, and without Grignard reagents, we simply wouldn't be able to do it because these chemicals are really, um, to try and make a carbon-carbon bond, needs a lot of energy, and it's really difficult to do because they're generally unreactive, like alkanes, for example. So Grignard reagents are organomagnesium compounds and they are made by reacting a halogenoalkane or haloalkane with magnesium in a dry ether. So here's an example here. So you've got your halogenoalkane reacting with magnesium and this forms your um, organomagnesium compound which is here. And so we can have like a specific example. So this is chloroethane, for example, reacting with magnesium. Uh, and this forms our um, organomagnesium compound or our Grignard reagent. So let's have a look at the reaction with carbon dioxide. So carboxylic acids can be made by reacting a Grignard reagent with carbon dioxide. So we can see it occurs in two steps. So we have a dry ether and we bubble carbon dioxide in the Grignard reagent and then we add dilute acid to the solution after that okay so let's have a look so here's our Grignard reagent here and this has got the alkyl group that we want to that we want to add on we've got our carboxylic acid uh, sorry our carbon dioxide here we're going to add dry ether first then we add the acid afterwards and then what we form is our carboxylic acid which is here so you can see where I've color coded it here so you've got the R group which is here and the carboxylic acid, uh, so the carbon dioxide, is effectively this bit here. And obviously we add the, the hydrogen here, which has come from the acid. And then we form, obviously, our, our byproduct, which is on the side there. So we have effectively have uh, formed, we've got a new CC bond is formed when the R here breaks off the Grignard reagent and bonds with the carbon in carbon dioxide. And obviously this, in turn, then breaks the C double bond O bond so that breaks this bond here. Um, so that was a double bond. Now that's a single bond to form this group here. And obviously the hydrogen then adds on afterwards. That's pretty clever because we've just made a carbon-carbon bond. And that's really difficult without, without this Grignard reagent to do that. So finally, like I say, the HCl protonates and forms the carboxylic acid. So obviously that was the, that was the hydrogen adding on there. Okay, so we can also use Grignard reagents to do carbon-carbon um, bond synthesis by um, a reaction with carbonyl compounds, which we've seen um, already in the previous topic, which is topic 17. Um, so alcohols can be made by reacting Grignard reagent with aldehydes and ketones. So again, happens in two steps. So dry ether, bubble the carbon, uh, so uh, bubble the... Um, uh, the aldehyde or ketone, should I say, and the Grignard reagent rather than the carbon dioxide, and we add uh, dilute acid to the solution. So you can see here, so instead of this, so we're not bubbling carbon dioxide, that was a, obviously that's an error, I'll get that all changed. And um, obviously, we're bubbling through our um, uh, aldehyde or ketone or carbonyl compound, so reacting that with that, dry ether, then acid, and you can see. Um, again, I've, I've marked it up in red so you can see what's going on. So the R is effectively added to the carbon here. So that just adds on to there. And then the hydrogen from the acid turns it into your um, alcohol, which is here. And then obviously we have MgBrCl as our byproduct there. So your new CC bond is formed when the R bit breaks off the Grignard reagent 
bonds with the carbon in the carbonyl group and this obviously in turn breaks the C double bond O bond um, O bond here to form your alcohol. So this is very similar to car uh, carbon dioxide reactions that you've seen already. Okay, so again that's the protonation using the acid. Okay, so here, this is where we're basically going to take, that's all the organic chemistry really that you that you need to know, all the basic reactions. So now what we're going to do is go through a summary phase. So we're going to summarize all the functional groups, the reaction types, and go through some organic synthesis um, summaries as well. Um, and then finally, we're going to look at some practical techniques um, towards the end of the video. So it is a very long video, as you can, as you can see. So um, functional groups. Okay, so we need to know the following functional groups, their properties, and their typical reactions. So we've come across a lot of functional groups over organic chemistry. So this is just a nice summary to look at. So alkanes, they have a CC single bond. They're unreactive and non-polar bond. And um, the type of reactions that they need to undergo are radical substitution. So because they're, they're pretty unreactive, so we need to form radicals. Um, alkenes have that double bond. Um, I'll put a bit of a joke to you, just um, just to break it up a little bit, I suppose. Um, why are Geordies so good at chemistry? Because they're alkene. Yeah, that would only come from a Geordie, wouldn't it? Um, anyway, so alkenes, the properties, um, electron-rich double bond. So we've got that double bond in the middle there. Uh, and it's a, a non-polar bond, so there's no polarity of this. Typical reactions, electrophilic addition. So we're using an electrophile, remember, and it adds on to that double bond. Uh, aromatic compounds, so properties, delocalized electron ring, and they're very, very stable, as we've seen. Uh, the reactions are electrophilic substitution. And alcohols, properties, and they've got lone pair on the oxygen that can act as the nucleophile, um, polar COH bond. Typical reactions, esterification and nucleophilic substitution, uh, and also dehydration, elimination, and nucleophilic substitution reactions as well. So there's a lot to do with alcohols. Um, Haloalkanes or halogenoalkanes, they have a polar CX bond, um, obviously with a halogen attached to it. Um, typical reactions, they undergo nucleophilic substitution and um, undergo elimination reactions as well to form your alkenes. Uh, nitrile reactions, so the properties, um, electron deficient uh, carbon center, um, because you've got that nitrogen pulling the electrons towards itself. Typical reactions, they undergo reduction and um, hydrolysis reactions as well. Um, and amines, so CNR group, remember, so they have a lone pair in the nitrogen, can act as a uh, as a base and a nucleophile, so it has, it has two functions there. Um, also, typical reactions, nucleophilic substitution, and they can obviously undergo neutralization reactions because of their basic properties. Aldehydes and ketones, they have the carbonyl group, um, which is polar, so you have that delta positive and the carbon there. Um, which is on this bit here, so you dealt the positive carbon. Uh, nucleophilic addition, oxidation of aldehydes, and reduction. So these are involved in a lot of reactions, as you've seen, as you've seen before. Um, and then carboxylic acids. Um, so they have the carboxyl group, the C double bond. Uh, uh, sorry, C double O H group, which means that it's a carboxylic acid. Um, the properties, it's electron deficient with that carbon center in the middle. So very similar to um, carbonyl compounds. Um, typical types of reactions are esterification and neutralization reactions. Esters. So esters, they have that electron deficient carbon center still. So um, that's quite important for, for um, um Ester reactions such as hydrolysis, which is breaking up of the ester using water. So hydro meaning water, lysis meaning to break. Acid anhydrides, we've seen some of them, in particular making um, uh, making aspirin, we use the anhydride. So they have um, an electron deficient carbon center. And obviously that's uh, typical reactions is esterification reactions. So in particular, uh, like I say, making um, aspirin. Um, acid chlorides or acyl chlorides as they're also known as um, have an electron deficient carbon center remember so that's right in the middle there um, and it's it's surrounded by oxygen and chlorine which are very electronegative so these undergo quite a few reactions such as nucleophilic addition elimination reactions condensation and friedel crafts acylation reactions as well um, and I think we've had carboxylic acids let me just check we have so we've had carboxylic acids there Okay, so we know about that one. So I'll 
get that one removed because I've done a know about carboxylic acids twice. I've just got a bit carried away there, I think, with that one. Okay, so what we need to be able to do, and I think the key thing within organic reactions is when you're being given... Uh, when you're given a lot of um, uh, molecules, and some of these molecules are massive, and they've got loads of different functional groups attached to them, um, the key thing with organic reactions is spot the functional group. So it's trying to find the functional group and know the types of reactions that we've seen all the way through, because you've now seen all the organic reactions that you need to know for, like, for a level. So um, it's about trying to spot these functional groups and knowing what type of reactions you can do with them. Don't worry about the bulk of the molecule. You'll need to know a tiny bit. So spotting the functional group is actually really important. So we're going to look at some examples here, and they're quite big molecules. They're done deliberately, okay, because the whole point is to just we're looking for the specific functional groups. So see if you can spot them as well. So here we've got paracetamol. So this is um, obviously a painkiller. So see if we can try and find the functional groups in this. So you can see we've got a phenol group which is there and we've also got an amide group which is there so we've got two functional groups there so we can immediately switch our brains on to amide reactions and phenol reactions what about adrenaline so have a think so have a look see what functional groups you can see in there well we can see we've got a phenol group again we've got an alcohol group and we've got an amine. So we've got three functional groups in that one. So we can apply any types of chemistry to them. Even though it's got two OH groups on that benzene, on that phenol, that's still classed as a phenol. Okay, what about this one? This is a an active uh, ingredient, so ethyl cyanoacrylate is used in super glue. So see if you can work out where the functional groups are on this one. So this is going to be over here, nitrile, and we've got a uh, alkenyl as well this is just a double bond an alkene and we've got this which is an ester so you can see we've got loads of different functional groups in there and about what we can do with them so for example we can do hydrolysis of the ester um you know we can do um uh, we could turn this amine into um no we can't <laughs> i was going to say we'd turn it into well we can actually yeah we can do amine into an amide so we can do that so we've got loads of different reactions here and obviously phenol reacting that with a base to form um uh, assault so we can do loads of things so that's the whole thing is about trying to look for functional groups okay so we're going to look at some reaction types and these can be split into seven main types of reactions so the first one is an addition reaction so addition reaction a double bond is broken and two molecules join to form a single product okay so the functional groups involved are generally alkenes um, and uh, carbonyl groups here as you can see so these are generally addition reactions substitution reactions this is where a functional group is exchanged for another one and so the functional groups involved are your halogens your benzenes because your h is substituted and alcohols elimination and dehydration reactions so a double bond is normally formed with these types of reactions so a functional group is removed um, and released as part of a smaller molecule so types of functional groups that are removed are um, uh, hydrogen halides for example and water molecules so this is an example of elimination reaction condensation reactions so um, this is when two molecules join um, and a small molecule is eliminated so the functional groups normally involved with condensation reactions are things like acid chlorides carboxylic acids amides and alcohols so you've seen all these reactions before this is just summarized in all of these Hydrolysis is the other one. So this is where um, two smaller molecules are formed by splitting a larger one um, uh, with water, such as breaking polyamides and polyesters. Um, and so we get the various different types of functional groups that are involved regarding hydrolysis. So remember, hydro meaning water, lysis meaning to split. Uh, oxidation reactions so normally means the gaining of oxygen or the loss of a hydrogen in um, reactions however theoretically it is the loss of electrons remember oxidation is the loss of electrons so oil rig um, so the functional groups involved are very typical primary alcohols um, as you can see here you've got primary alcohols going to an aldehyde going to a carboxylic acid or secondary alcohol going to a, a ketone 
Um, and the final type of reaction type is our reduction reactions. So reduction reactions is the gain of electrons, remember, so oil rig. Um, and this is basically just the opposite of oxidation. So you've got a carboxylic acid going to an aldehyde and a primary alcohol or a ketone going down to a secondary alcohol. So there are seven um, reaction types. Okay, so with this one, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at um, organic synthesis. So we're going to put all of them different things together. And what you be able, what you should be able to do is take the information that you've learned for organic chemistry and put it all together to form a synthetic root. Because this is vitally important for chemists to be able to use their knowledge to be actually make something from it. So we need to know your aliphatic organic chemistry reactions. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through... Um, each one of them so I'm going to put up the arrow and it might be a good idea for you to, to practice this and the key thing is to practice this over time because there's no way you could look at all this and do it within an hour just it, unless you've got superhuman brain um, so what we're going to do what I thought we'd do might make it a little bit more interactive is to um, when I go through these I want you to these are all the reactions you need to know for Edexcel okay so what I want you to do is to um, you know if you want to pause the video um so i'll release an arrow pause the video see if you can get the reaction conditions right the temperatures and the reagents that we use and then unpause the video and then what i'll do is i'll release the the answers on here so see if you can go through see how many you can get and build it up so let's start with the first one so this one here alcohol to aldehyde so pause the video and see if you can work out what's required to turn alcohol to aldehyde okay well the answer is potassium dichromate sulfuric acid and we're heating a primary alcohol in a distillation kit to get your aldehyde so what about aldehyde to alcohol so pause it and see if you can work out what the answer is okay well this is sodium borohydride so NaBH4 in methanol and water uh, what about aldehyde to carboxylic acid well this one's dichromate so potassium dichromate um, sulfuric acid and it's all done in the reflux what about alcohol to ketone? Well, this one's potassium dichromate but we're, and sulfuric acid and heat, but we're using a secondary alcohol for this one because obviously we're forming a ketone in a reflux kit as well. What about ketone to alcohol? Uh, well, this one's sodium borohydride in methanol and water. So what about alcohol to alkene? So this one is concentrated sulfuric acid and um, phosphoric acid and heat. So either one of them, conch, sulfuric or phosphoric and heat. So what about alkene to alcohol? Well, this one's steam, um, phosphoric acid catalyst, age 3 po 4 um, 60 atmospheres and 300 degrees Celsius. So what about alcohol to haloalkane? Uh, well, this one is um, uses sodium halide, so NAX, sulfuric acid and it's going to be done at 20 degrees celsius so what about haloalkane to alcohol well this one's going to be warm sodium hydroxide and water uh, and it's going to be done under reflux what about alkane to haloalkane well this one's going to be um, a halogen and we're going to use uv light so that's the radical formation one so what about alkene to haloalkane well, this one's going to be um, hydrogen halide, and it's going to be at 20 degrees Celsius. So what about haloalkane to alkene? Uh, well, this one is potassium hydroxide, ethanol, and reflux. So this is obviously uh, an elimination reaction. We're removing to form your alkene. What about alkene to dihaloalkene? Dihaloalkane, should I say. Well, this one is we're using a halogen. And um, we're going to react that with 20 degrees. So that's like um, bromine water, a decolorization of bromine. What about alkene to diol? Okay, well, this one's going to be acidified um, potassium manganate, KMnO4. Uh, obviously, that should be a small 4 there uh, at 20 degrees Celsius. So we'll get that changed. And then what about alkene to alkane? So this one should be hydrogen, a nickel catalyst, and at 150 degrees Celsius. And then what about alcohol to iodoalkane? 
Well, this is iodine, so I2, and again, that should be a small 2, uh, red phosphorus, and obviously under reflux. And carboxylic acid to alcohol. Uh, well, this one's going to be lithium aluminium hydride, um, and this obviously forms your primary alcohol from your carboxylic acid, so we're using a reducing agent for that one. Okay, so there's a few more here. So you can see there's no way you'd be able to know all of these off by heart, um, you know, right from the off. So you need to give it loads of time, you know, build it up every week. See if you can get 10% of them right, that's fine. Um, and then um, see if you can do the following week, see if you can get 15% right. And then the following week, 20%. And just keep on going at them, keep practicing them. Okay, so let's do the same again. So here are while came, this is taken from the previous slide. I couldn't fit it all in one. Um, go into a nitrile. So this is potassium cyanide, ethanol, and reflux. And what about nitrile to primary amine? Um, well, this is lithium aluminium hydride or dilute sulfuric acid we can use, or we can use a hydrogen nickel platinum catalyst at a high temperature uh, and pressure, or we can use sodium, ethanol, or reflux. You can use either one of them. Okay, so what about haloalkane to primary amine? Okay, well, this is uh, ammonia, NH3, and heat. So what about nitrile to carboxylic acid? So that was from the previous slide. Okay, well, this one's dilute HCl and reflux. So what about haloalkane to carboxylic acid? Well, this one's um, using magnesium, a dry ether, and carbon dioxide in dilute acid. So this is your uh, Grignard reagent. So what about uh, aldehyde or ketone to hydroxynitrile? Well, this one's potassium cyanide, sulfuric acid, and it's at 20 degrees Celsius. So what about acyl chloride to carboxylic acid? Okay, so this is water, uh, and it's at 20 degrees Celsius. So then what about uh, carboxylic acid to acyl chloride or acid chloride? Well, this one we're using SOCl2 to get that reaction out. And then what about aldehyde or ketone to form your ester? So this is going to be concentrated sulfuric acid, um, alcohol, um, heat, and a catalyst. So effectively um, to, um, to form your ester there. And then ester to carboxylic acid. So this is going to be dilute sulfuric acid, water, reflux, and catalyst, or we can use dilute sodium hydroxide and reflux. So what about ester to alcohol? Well, this one's going to be dilute acid um, or alkali, um, and this is going to be done under reflux. So what about alcohol to ester? Well, this one's going to be uh, carboxylic acid, um, acid catalyst, heat, or acyl chloride, depending on what you would like to use there. And then what about acyl chloride to primary amine? Well, this is going to be ammonia, and it's going to be at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we're going to look at, so they're all your aliphatic ones that you need to know. Um, and we're now going to look at your aromatic ones. So I'm just going to go through these ones, just so, um, just so you know the reactions of them, of course. So we're going to start with benzene. So benzene to form nitrobenzene is nitration. So we're going to use conch sulfuric acid and nitric acid at under 55 to get mononitration. Remember, if you go over 55 degrees, you're going to get loads of nitration. Um, reduction um, will give us a phenyl amine. So this is using conch, HCl, tin, and reflux, and we add sodium hydroxide, and that will give us obviously the reduction reaction. And then we've got acylation. So this is one of your Friedel-Crafts reactions. So using an acid chloride and an aluminium chloride halogen carrier um, as a catalyst. And we're going to do it in reflux uh, under anhydrous conditions to form our phenyl ketone. So benzene again. So to form a halo benzene, um, this is halo halogenation. So um, all we do is we add um, a halogen, so X2, to aluminium chloride catalyst um, under warm conditions. Um, so alkyl benzene, so alkylation, so hal haloalkane. Again, we're going to use a um, halogen carrier, ALCl3 catalyst, and it's all going to be done under reflux. Um, looking at phenol reactions, 
So phenol forming sodium phenoxide is using sodium hydroxide at 20 degrees Celsius. And phenol um, to form 246 tribromophenol, we're going to use bromine water, which is Br2, um, and at 20 degrees Celsius, and we'll get multiple um, multiple substitution there. Okay. So organic compounds, these can be identified using molecular and empirical formula. So we're going to look at um, identifying some of these substances. This is a little bit of maths involved in this section here. So the actual number of atoms um, is, uh, so the actual number of atoms in a molecule or an element is the molecular formula. So for example, um, we're going to look at example for ethane is C2H6. So this actually tells you how many atoms are in there. So the empirical formula um, is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms in a compound. And it's given, for example, um, for ethane, um, the empirical formula is CH3. So we're just given the simplest ratio of carbon to hydrogen within the empirical formula. So the empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of elements in a compound, remember. So we're going to have a look at an example of how we can calculate empirical formula. So a compound contains 23.3% magnesium, 30.7% sulfur, 46% oxygen. Um, what is the empirical formula for this compound? So you can see here, the first thing we need to do is write out the elements involved. So we've got a magnesium, we've got a sulfur, and we've got an oxygen, because this is what we've been told at the top. And so then what we're going to do is write out the percentages as masses. So you can see here, we've been given the percentages of 23.3, 30.7, and 46%. All we do is take the same numbers and just put G at the end of it. So we're just converting them as grams. And then we divide these by the relative atomic masses to get the number of moles so the relative atomic mass of um, magnesium is 24.3 of sulfur is 32.1 and of oxygen is 16 and obviously we get the number of moles that's written down there and we then divide all of these by the smallest numbers um, to get uh, by the smallest number of moles so for example here um, we had um, 0.96 is the smallest so we divide all of them by 0.96 and we get our ratio of 1 to 1 to 3 and obviously from that we can then deduce our uh, empirical formula as MgSO3 so that's the simplest whole number uh, uh, ratio here um, now you can see to work out the molecular formula from this all we do is we work out the um, molecular uh, the MR or, of the empirical formula and we divide by the MR of the molecular formula and we should get a number and we use that number to multiply all the atoms in the empirical formula to get your molecular formula so for example if we divided the number and we got two then we just multiply all of the uh, uh, atoms in the empirical formula by two so it'll be mg2 um, S2 or 6 as an example let's say sometimes your empirical formula can actually be the molecular formula as well um, so for example if we work out the um, relative molecular mass of this and divide it by the relative molecular mass of the um, actual mass of the compound the molecular formula and we get 1 then it means we multiply everything by 1 we're just left with the same formula so yeah so that's how you work that out so empirical formula can also be used to work, uh, uh, can also be um, worked out from combustion analysis as well of burning an organic compound completely. So let's look at an example. So hydrocarbon combusts completely to make 0 0.84, 0 0.845 grams of carbon dioxide and 0.173 grams of water. So what is the empirical formula of the hydrocarbon? So here we go. The first thing we need to do is we need to write down um, our headings, which is uh, water and carbon dioxide as our headings, because these are the combustion products. Um, and then we write the masses of each molecule underneath. So because we've got 0.845 of carbon dioxide and 0.173 grams of water. We then divide these by relative molecular masses to get the number of moles. So the relative molecular mass of carbon dioxide is 44 and the relative molecular mass of water is 18. So we get the total number of moles for each 0.019 and 0.0096. So one mole of carbon dioxide has one mole of carbon atoms. So the original hydrocarbon 
must have 0.019 moles of carbon atoms. So it must do because this is the only source. This is only where it comes from. And so one mole of water has two moles of hydrogen. So remember, okay. So original hydrocarbon must have had 0.0096 times by two, which is 0.0192 moles of hydrogen atoms. So remember, the carbon in the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen in H2O can only come from the hydrocarbon, okay? So then once we've got that information, we then now divide um, the number of carbon and hydrogen atoms by the smallest number of moles. So you can see here that's 0.019. So we're going to do 0.019 divided by 0.019 gives us 1, and then that's 1. So then we can work out empirical formula here as CH. Okay. So... Combustion analysis um, can also be given as volumes by using molar ratio of gas volumes and we can work out the molecular mass of an unknown substance. So let's have a look. So we've got 25 centimetres cubed of an unknown hydrocarbon X was burnt completely with 125 centimetres cubed of O2 and 75 centimetres cubed of CO2 was produced. So here we're going to calculate the molecular formula of hydrocarbon X. So we're going to use the volumes given to create our molar ratio equation. So we've got the volumes here. So we're going to put 25x plus 125O2 equals 75 or produces 75 CO2 and NH2O because we don't know what this value is. So we've literally just put the volumes in there. The next thing we need to simplify that because they're far too big, obviously. Uh, simplify the equation by dividing by the smallest number. In this case, it's 25. And that gets us something a little bit more manageable. So we've got X, 5O2, 3CO2, and NH2O. So then, now we, so we see we can have, or we have 5 moles of oxygen producing 3 moles of carbon dioxide and N moles of water. And any oxygen produced that is not accounted for in CO2 has to be in the water, okay? Because that's the only other place it could go. So N in that case is going to be 5 times 2, okay, which is the amount of oxygen here, minus the amount of oxygen in here, and that will tell us what, what's left here. So the answer is 4. So now we have the following equation, which is x 5 2 3 CO2, and 4 H2O. So... We can see the last step here. So the carbon in CO2, which we can see is um, uh, three, okay? So here, so we've got three carbons. And the hydrogen in H2O, so we'll have eight of them because it's four H2O, can only come from the hydrocarbon. So we can now work out the formula of X. So it's C3H8, and it's as simple as that. Okay, a little bit of algebra there, but remember the first thing you need to do is add all of your um, your masses in there and put them in front, simplify it, work out um, you know obviously the number of moles of water, and then we use the hydrogens and oxygens and uh, hydrogens and carbons that we know from our products to work out the molecular formula of our um, reactant. Okay, so. This is the last part. The last part of this video looks at uh, practical techniques. So ways in which you can um, make things, measure things, purify things and test things. So we're going to start with reflux first. So reflux is a technique and we've seen this already in organic chemistry. All of this is used in organic chemistry. So reflux is a technique you use when you want to heat a volatile liquid. So reflux allows us to heat something really strongly without losing it into the atmosphere. Um, and um, effectively it works by heating a volatile compound in here. It evaporates up the column uh, and then condenses back down. And we use this Liebig condenser to do it. The Liebig condenser actually has water going in here and then water coming out here. And we've got it surrounding this inner tube in the middle there. And effectively this condenses back down into the round fob bottom flask and that allows it to react further and so as we're using flammable liquids heating is always done either via water bath or a heating mantle because what we don't want to do is use a naked flame near anything that could catch fire otherwise you really do have a bit of a problem on your hands if you do that okay so let's look at another one which is distillation so distillation is used when we want to separate substances with different boiling points so this is ideal for example for extracting an aldehyde so 
gently heating the mixture will result in the compounds separating out in order of boiling point. And knowing the boiling point of the chemical you are um, you want to separate will allow you to decide how you are going to separate your compound. Okay, so if your compound has a lower boiling point than your starting mixture, then you heat to the temperature of the boiling point of your compound you want to separate, and we collect that in our vessel because obviously that's the first one that's going to boil first. That's going to come out of this um, this flask here, condense against the condenser here, turn back into a liquid, and we can collect it back in the vessel at the end. So if your compound is a higher boiling point than your start and, uh, than the start and mixture, then you heat to the temperature of the boiling point of your compound you want to separate and your compound will remain in that flask. So obviously we evaporate off the one that we don't want. That goes into the separate flask on the right and the ones that we do want will remain in the flask because that has a higher boiling point. And so distillation, like I say, is useful. We'll want to extract a chemical before it reacts any further. So for example, oxidizing primary alcohols to an aldehyde and um, we want to extract that aldehyde straight away because if we just leave it in there to react further it will oxidize further to a carboxylic acid so distillation is good for that okay so steam distillation so steam distillation is used when we want to separate substances with high boiling points or the ones that decompose when they're heated so for example if a product is immiscible with water, um, then steam distillation is used to separate compounds that couldn't be done under standard distillation. So you can see the steam, this is the first bit, is produced and is pushed through an impure sample. So it's pushed through here, as you can see. Um, and the steam lowers the boiling point of the immiscible product, so that's the bit that can't mix, um, and allows for it to be distilled out of the mixture before it actually decomposes so that's pretty clever um, and the second um, so the second thing is that this method is also used uh, as useful for substances we want to separate at high boiling point uh, as the steam reduces this so if um, this is lower then it means we are able to separate them as normal so if the substance, this is the second uh, second part here of the of the apparatus. So if the substance we're trying to collect is less volatile than the constituent substances we're trying to separate from, in other words, that's in here, then the desired product will evaporate out the flask with the steam. So that'll come out of here and down in here with the steam, which comes out to the bottom. And then. Um, this is obviously conde condensed and collected in the separate flask at the bottom there. Now, the key thing here is now we have a mixture of steam and our volatile compound that's, that's obviously mixed in here. So we can separate this by using a separating funnel. So if the product is partially miscible, then we may have to use solvent extraction. And we're going to um, look at that now about how to do that. So in other words, if the um, solvent here is actually mixes a little bit with the water then we need to do a separate technique it's not quite as simple as just um, decanting it from there so separation and purification so separation techniques are used to remove impurities that are dissolved in water so that could be as a result of that previous uh, technique that we'd seen there so separation so this is um, a useful uh, method when we add the products from the distillation what we've seen before into a separating funnel shown on the left here and we add the water to dissolve the soluble impurities and create an aqueous solution so we add water in here and that dissolves the soluble um, soluble impurities in here so that that's poured out through there and then after allowing the solution to settle we get two layers that form we get a top layer which is your impure products so that's what you're wanting and the bottom layer is the aqueous layer containing them soluble impurities and we drain that off um obviously we drain that off down here and i've got to remember to remove the stopper because if you have the stopper on there it won't actually come out here so remember to remove the stopper and then drain that off and then we now need to purify our sample through two further steps so we need to wash it and we need to dry it so this is our sample here because it may still have impurities in there so um, so we're going to um, remove impurities by washing first. So there are or there may be some unwanted impurities still in that solution. So we need to remove these by washing the product with another liquid. So this is what we call washing. So if, for example, we had a carboxylic acid um, as an impurity, we add sodium hydrogen carbonate to this solution. And obviously, this would react with that 
to form your salt and carbon dioxide gas. The salt would dissolve in that aqueous layer that we've just added, um, and that would leave our purified organic compound in the top layer. So, so that's that would be a, a, an ideal uh, way of removing, say, carboxylic acid impurity. And um, we can also remove water as an impurity by drying. So we take that impure product from the separating funnel and we add it to the round bottom flask. So for example, we can add anhydrous calcium chloride. This is a dehydrating agent. Remove, um, and it will remove the aqueous substances that may be still remaining in your sample. We invert the flask a few times um, and we leave it for 20 to 30 minutes to allow it to um, separate back out again. And then what we can do is we can filter this. We can use fluted filter paper to increase the su surface area um, to filter that solid drying agent out of your substance and just to try and get that. So all these techniques are about purifying your sample that you've just made, so removing these impurities. So filtration, so we're gonna look at two types. Gravity filtration is used to separate solids from liquids. So this method is used if you wish to keep the liquid part of our substance. So we dispose of the solid. So very simple. We just place a bit of filtered, filter, uh, fluted filter paper, um, which is just concentinated into the funnel. We dampen it just to create a bit of a seal. We pour the reaction mixture into the funnel. Um, and we do that slowly because we don't want, obviously, to overflow out of the funnel. Uh, and then gravity will just pull the liquid through um, into the vessel below. Um, and obviously our solid and will remain in the in the um, filter paper and we can purify that liquid that we've collected obviously um, and we can dispose of the solid in the filter paper appropriately um, the other way of filtration is using something called vacuum filtration um, and this is useful for separating liquids from solids so we use a buckner funnel and filter paper and we connect it up to a, a vacuum system normally you just plug it into a tap you have a contraption which creates a, a negative pressure so it helps, the vacuum is used to help separate the liquid and solid components thoroughly. Um, we use a filter paper here, so we use a, a disc instead, and we just um, dampen it slightly in the Buckner funnel um, to create that seal, and we pour the reaction mixture into the Buckner funnel um, with the vacuum line on, and the vacuum creates that reduced pressure in the flask, it pulls the liquid through, um, and the solid will be left in the, in the Buckner funnel at the top. Okay, so... Fairly straightforward, you would have seen this before. Um, and obviously the solids that we've collected in the top there, we can recrystallize that and to purify it further. Okay, so let's look at recrystallization. So recrystallization is a method used to purify solids um, and the solvent has to be chosen very, very carefully. So all we do is we add just enough hot solvent to allow the impure solid to dissolve. And so this will mean that you have a saturated solution of your impure product. It's very important. You just add just enough solvent to allow that to dissolve. So you allow that solution to cool down slowly. And what we'll see is crystals just starting to form as it, as it cools down. And your impurities will actually remain dissolved in the solution as there's a smaller quantity of them. So they'll, they'll remain dissolved and it takes a lot longer for them to crystallize out. So the crystals you're forming will be actually your product that you want. And so we filter to get your solid purified crystals. We wash them with very cold solvent to dry them off because we don't want them to dissolve. So we must use a, like a, an ice cold solvent. But we've got to use our solvent carefully. We've got to choose it carefully. So we want our impure solid to dissolve fully in hot solvent but we want it to be virtually insoluble in a cold solvent we don't want our solid to just dissolve so if your substance won't dissolve in the hot solvent then obviously you can't you can't filter it um, and obviously um, that's not a good idea because you want your solid product <clears throat> okay so let's look at the um, we've made our solid products and now we want to know how pure it is and we can use and um, boiling points to measure the purity of something so measuring the boiling point of your substance can help to detect impurities in there so we can determine the boiling point of a liquid for example by using a distillation uh, setup on the left so this is how we're going to determine the purity of a liquid if we're collecting a liquid so if we gently heat the sample we can measure the temperature at which it distills using the thermometer um, in the equipment um, and so this is the boiling point and then what we can do is compare the boiling point from this 
against the data book value to see how um, see how it compares. And basically, if your sample does contain impurities, then um, your boiling point um, is higher than what's recorded in the data book. Um, so your sample um, boils over a range of temperatures is another one. So if you have um, a sharp temp a boiling point, if it boils at a very specific temperature, then that's fine. If it's boiling over a, a range temperature, a range of temperatures, then clearly that's not that's not going to be much good uh, because you contain you may have impurities in there. So there's two ways. So you if the boiling point is higher than what's recorded in the data book, then you have impurities, and if the boiling point is not excuse me, if the boiling point is not sharp then um, then obviously it will have impurities in there as well. So what we've got to be careful of is that various organic compounds have the same boiling point, so it's not an exact science here. Um, so we need to use other an other analytical techniques, um, such as mass spectrometry, to spot any impurities as well in our sample. Okay, so the purity of a compound, um, like I say, can be determined by measuring the melting point. So this is for solids in particular. So um, all we do is we add a sample of the solid product into a capillary tube, which is just a really fine tube. You may have used them in school or college. Um, you seal the end of the glass tube in the Bunsen flame, and then you gently tap the solid product into the capillary tube. It's a very, very fine tube. And we put it into a heating element of a melting point apparatus that looks like this. Um, and then what we do is we slowly increase the temperature of the substance until that starts to melt. And there is a temperature range for when the solid just starts to melt to when it fully melts. And we can see that by looking into the viewfinder here and we get a magnified um, view of the solid in the tiny little tube to see how that melts. You can see it melting as it goes through. And then what we're going to do is compare the melting point against the data book values. Okay. And then... Basically, if your substance contains impurities, um, the melting point will be lower, and if the temperature and the temperature range will be larger as well. So we're looking for this is ideal if we want to test the purity of the solid that we've produced. And that is it. Okay, this is a massive, massive video. Okay, so but you can take bits and pieces from it. You can obviously clearly it's designed so you can uh, either have a full summary. Um, of topic 18 or you can um, jump to different parts of the video to get the bits that you need but I do have whiteboard videos that look into that as well uh, like I say there's a full range of videos for edXL on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel um, they're all for free um, have a good look there all I ask is you hit the subscribe button um, and just to show your support that would be fantastic um, also the um, uh, uh, slides that you see here they are, are available obviously I'll get the little bits um, sorted out on them as well but they are available if you just click on the link uh, in the description box you'll be able to purchase them there they're great value but that's it okay bye bye